What I want to talk about more today is a little bit more about like the indigenous missile defense systems. Um, so it, they're generally kind of all fall under this area of Korean air and missile defense. Um, so on the second slide, there's this card at the top that talks about what some of the different ones are. So, and it kind of explains that since 2006, Seoul has been working on low altitude defense. There's the Korea air and missile defense, all right? There, it's currently based on the Israeli Citron tree system, two green uh, pine early warning radars. Um, it has included eight uh, strategic location batteries with 48 launchers, mostly on PAC-2. And I'll talk more about like PAC-2 and PAC-3. Um, the ROK Navy also has these destroyers with Aegis systems and SM-2 missiles. And then there's also PAC-3 interceptors. Um, and then there's other, other things they're potentially talking about developing from Israel. So Israel ha so South Korea like has some of its own missile defense systems. And so kind of the important parts are like, what, you know, on the next slide, what, what are the parts of the KAMDS? How effective are they? And one really big issue is how are they independent? And like, how are they independent of the U.S. system? And how do they integrate into the U.S. system? Because it's a huge issue uh, in Korea right now. Because like part of the problem with that is that China fears that we're interlock the defense systems between Japan, South Korea, um, and, uh, you know, the United States. So there's a question of like how independent they are. Um, they also say that like this this kind of talk is like pretty hard to give. Like there's just there's just there's some stuff written on Korean missile defense systems. Like as you know, you've been debating it, but there's not like a big debate about it. Like there's not a big debate about like whether or not Korea should have missile defense. Like they should be able to defend themselves from incoming missiles. It's just not like really um, controversial. Now on this next slide, like four. All right, there's some more detail on the. Um, Missile to system. So we have the MSAM, the medium range surface to air missile. Okay. Um, it kind of about becoming operational. Uh, it had originally intended to have the system deployed in the early 20, in the 2020s, but because of North Korea, they're trying to deploy it faster. Then they have these PAC 2, which are Patriot systems. They were purchased from Germany. They're originally US systems, but Germany had them. They don't like really use them as much. So um, they're kind of, they bought a lot of these from Germany, and they're pretty much under the control of the South Koreans. Um, but then they have these PAC-3 systems that are purchased from the U.S., which are, don't, like, the U.S. really has control over that. But it doesn't really have some, as much control over PAC-3, but it still has a lot. Um, they're deployed at, both PAC-2 and PAC-3 are deployed at U.S. military bases. All right, and they're oriented around defending Seoul. Uh, the Patriots handle tactical ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, advanced aircraft. Um, then you have the, um, the Aegis, the Aegis Destroyer, which is shipped to air missiles. It's designed to intercept low-flying, short, and medium-range missiles from uh, North Korea. And there's a little more about it there uh, on the next slide. And then you also have this Israeli-made system, all right, on, on, uh, at the bottom. Now, to move over to slide six, more notes about the PAC. All right, PAC-2 is very limited. It has low interception rate. All right, only about 40%. It also can't destroy nuclear biological warheads. That's why PAC-3 is like pretty important. PAC-3 can at least deploy or destroy nuclear and biological warheads, and it has a greater interception. It like succeeds 70% of the time. Um, North Korea's Scud missiles pose the closest threat to the capital regions as they are deployed 100 to 200 kilometers away. So these Patriot missile batteries can hit things that are kind of deployed 100 to 200 kilometers away. Okay, now also, I don't know, like, THAAD, THAAD can hit things that are, like, shot from, like, 300 kilometers away. Okay, that's why THAAD's deployed in the very south of South Korea. All right, now, it is kind of interesting to note that Seoul, I mean, Seoul's not, Seoul could be attacked by SCUD missiles that have, like, these ranges of, like, 300 kilometers if they're shot from North Korea. But for the most part, North Korea is not going to attack Seoul um, with ballistic missiles. Does anybody know how far Seoul is from... It's like 30 miles, all right? It's like you, you can drive up there. Like I went on a tour, and the bus took like less than an hour, all right, to get up there. So they can kind of hit it with cannons and like rocket artillery. Um, and they can also infiltrate people through the tunnels and also just kind of like invade the place. So there's really not a lot that missile, can, missile defense can do to defend Seoul, which is important to note because when the pros like read all these impact cards about how North Korea is going to destroy Seoul, it's not really clear how like missile defense would solve any of that. I mean, it might... 
it might prevent like some Scud missiles from hitting Seoul, which is like good. Um, but it's not really like most of where most of the uh, attacks are going to work, or, or how how they're going to come from. So then in the next slide, right, it just kind of shows you how the Patriot works, um, which is kind of I mean you can look at it in more detail on your own. So the big discussion to have, okay, is are Korean systems independent? Uh, yes, they are to a degree. They own the technology, right? So they own they buy these systems. Um, they've developed some of these systems. But no, like their systems still use U.S. equipment. Like even the Pac 2s originally were um, part of the U.S. system. And they also depend on a lot of satellite data. Like the only way the interceptors are going to work, right, is if the if they gain the data like from the United States and like they come in and they do the interceptions. Um, so what does this mean for the topic? Well, on the pro, the one thing you really want to argue for is like a multi-layer defense. So you have to do a couple things. You can argue for a multi-layer defense, right? So the pack, the pack 2s can intercept some of the missiles as long as they don't have chemical and biological weapons. Pack 3s can intercept more of the missiles that are located around the Seoul area. Uh, THAAD can intercept, like in the south, things that are coming at like U.S. bases. And they have different points of intercept, like Pack 3s intercept at mid altitude. Theater, THAAD, theater, high area, right? Anti missile defense intercepts at high altitude. So it kind of gives you multiple points of opportunity to intercept the missile. So if one of the intercepts fails, you have the other one. They're designed kind of for different geographic regions. Like I think you want to argue for like a, a comprehensive defense. Um, the other thing that kind of presents is that. You know, if you're going to defend that on the pro, um, you might want to argue for a trilateral missile defense system, security cooperation between uh, Japan, the United States, and South Korea. That's probably, there's probably one, the U.S. probably wants to deploy that for two reasons. The one is that it wants to build this missile defense network between Japan, the United States, and South Korea to contain China. All right, so that's, and maybe Russia, but that's probably one of the reasons it wants to do it. The second reason it wants to do it is that maybe, I mean, this is at the margins, but it can get data faster on um, like a North Korean ballistic missile launch, and it can get the data to Alaska faster. So if it's an intercontinental ballistic missile that's coming to hit the United States, it could make it more likely. And then, of course, that they would be intercepted. And then, of course, there's just benefits to the trilateral defense, like increasing security ties. So... I think that's kind of like a reasonable argument if you want to talk about that. Um, you know, yeah. So I read that and someone had a really good response and it's like, how is it that like adding Japan into like the game, how would that make China like, like why would that pressure China? Okay, so there's a couple of reasons. So one is that, you know, if you just kind of look up the coast, the east coast of China, like China is kind of like up there, right? Mm -hmm. Like across from, across from China, right? So you get more interceptors right in that place. And second of all, it's not just about the interceptors, it's about the defense ties, right? When you strengthen the defense ties between the United States, South Korea, and Japan, you have three countries that are kind of now like pushing against China, right? So there's also kind of like symbolic and just kind of relationship reasons that are related to it. How much of a difference it makes? Of course, that's difficult to tell, right? It's kind of at the margins. And say like in debate, sometimes we debate these things like A causes B, right? Like, and we know, but it's like, it's more, I think, you, you know, we're in that discussion with Dino, like, you know, what's the threshold? Like, what's the brink? I mean, we don't really know, but it's more just that they oppose this trilateral defense cooperation. There's one good article I read that said that this is really the main reason they're objecting to THAAD. Because it said, look, THAAD can't really shoot down Chinese missiles that would, like, attack the United States, right? It doesn't have that capability. It doesn't have a capability against intercontinental ballistic missiles, okay? And second of all, the amount of added surveillance it gets from Ch against China is pretty minimal compared to all the surveillance we already have. And at the very least, if China was that afraid, they could just move their more of their missiles outside of their surveillance area. So it says that they're probably not really like pressing this issue so much because of its actual capabilities, um, but because it fears like this trilateral defense cooperation. And, you know, maybe this trilateral defense cooperation, and I think this is another area that you could really impact your arguments on the... Um, on the pro potentially is to say, look, trilateral defense um, cooperation will can contain Chinese aggression in the South China Sea. Um, the other thing that was in the news this morning is that the U.S. just did what we've done these before, like even under the Obama administration, called I think Freedom of Navigation 
It's like FONS, but I forget what the S stands for. Freedom of Navigation, where the U.S. sailed uh, a missile, uh, sailed a, a destroyer, a ship destroyer, within 12 miles of this contested island where China is building up in the South China Sea. So the South China Sea is a, a flashpoint for conflict. China is kind of arguably being aggressive there. Um, it could be going after resources, um, those types of things. So if these, if the U.S., South Korea, and uh, in Japan all get along very well, that could more aggressively like kind of contain their ambitions, right? Just like cooperating. And it's more just the cooperation, like spilling over to these other regions. The one thing that makes it super difficult is that Japan and South Korea have like pretty terrible historical relations, right? Like Japan attacks South Korea. I mean, Japan attacked Korea, right? Like if you, like if you go even to these areas like Busan, like I went to Busan, which is like one of these areas where U.S. troops would enter. And I went to this like history museum. And the whole history museum was just about like how Japan attacked South Korea. All right. And I went to this other like history museum and they kind of like did the same thing. And, it, you know, it's like, hey, South Korea, maybe you should stop just defining yourselves in terms of like how Japan attacked you. But there's a lot of tension between South Korea and Japan. Um, so one of the reasons that you, uh, South Korea wants to develop its own missile defense is to break away, right, from Japan. Not really so much to break away from the U.S., but to break away from Japan. And there's good evidence that says, like, it, even with these, uh, that any data they collect through the missile defense systems, any surveillance data, those type of things, they won't share with Japan. So one kind of big, like, other problem with this advantage is that it's just really difficult to facilitate this type of, like, all you're really arguing for at best on the pro is that that should be deployed. It's kind of difficult to get from that deployment to the co to the defense cooperation between the three countries as possible. But South Korea is going to kind of be really is going to really fight it off. Right. There would have to be a lot of pressure um, to do it. Is this the alliance already? Well, sure. Like I say, these things are kind of like at the margins. Well, the U.S. and South Korea have a pretty strong alliance. The U.S. and Japan have, like, a very strong alliance. How much there's an alliance between the three of them is kind of like, eh, right? Like, there's no formal alliance, right? Now, they're all Western powers that are definitely all opposed to North Korea that kind of kind of have competing interests, like, vis-a-vis -vis China, right? And, you know, China's interests are, you know, also partly defensive, like, Japan also invaded China. Like, you can go to Nanjing in China and go to the Nanjing Massacre Museum, and all it is is, like, it's like the Holocaust Museum, except it's, like, the Chinese Holocaust Museum, right, where Japan came in and, like, destroyed, like, Nanjing and, like, killed all these people and raped all these women. It's, like, pretty graphic. And, like, it, the point of this museum is to kind of let people know, like, how bad Japan is, right? So J China kind of has, like, its own, like, defensive rationale. So these countries are kind of not all kind of completely aligned with one another. Right. Like they do have kind of mutual like Japan, South, Japan, South Korea and the United States have a mutual interest in like kind of trying to contain China, arguably. Um, they certainly have a mutual interest in containing North Korea. But South Korea and South Korea does not have kind of the same interest in aligning with Japan that the United States does. So the question becomes is like how much closer the U.S. could kind of push those countries together, like into a kind of not like a formal alliance system, but kind of like cooperating together to kind of be more effective at containing China. Um, I mean, it would be good. Like I haven't, you know, I haven't really seen like a really good card that kind of just says this would like cement the three, right, countries working together. I have cards that kind of say with like strength and ties. The U.S. is like trying to promote a, secure, a trilateral security alliance. So, you know, I just kind of started doing like a little additional research on like trilateral security alliance. If you type that in like, trilateral security alliance in like Korea or in Japan, then you'll get these articles about like missile defense and like how difficult it is to um, kind of create these trilateral relationships. So do you think the argument is very strong? Um, I think it's a reason. I wouldn't, I don't think it's just, I think it's kind of a little bit of a weak argument, like just on its own. But I think that, like, say you had an advantage, like North Korea is a threat, right? And you got to think about, like, how you can solve, like, the North Korean threat. Like, well, one, so you can deploy, you can argue for more deployment of 
missile defense, or even the way the resolutions were to just defend existing missile defense. So A, existing missile defense has some capabilities against North Korean missiles, right? Like that too even provides some protection against like conventional attacks of Seoul. Okay, we have Aegeus systems that make it more difficult for the North Korean Navy to attack. We have a THAAD system in South Korea that's probably designed, and I'll show you a map a little bit of this later, to allow our troops to enter south, the south of South Korea kind of in the event of a war. Um, so that's kind of one way, right, that it reduces the Korea threat. It reduces, like in a war, it protects troops. It makes it more difficult for North Korea to win a war, you know, or to like execute it with fewer casualties, which may create some deterrence. Right. The second way is that it promotes defense cooperation between the United States and South Korea. That could create some deterrence vis-a-vis -vis -vis the North, and there might be some other advantages or impacts you could read to relations. The third reason it might help deter North Korea is that it creates a trilateral security alliance. Do you see what I'm saying? And so now North Korea is going to say, all right, Japan, the United States, and South Korea are closely aligned. Because now North Korea might see that is like a vulnerability. Like North Korea might think, okay, well, yeah, they, we kind of have these three powers over here, but in a war, like is Japan really going to defend like South Korea? Does South Korea really want Japan to defend them? Can we try to split like the relationships between these countries? Um, so I think that I think that as part of another argument, it has some value. Um, like, yeah, you can get Japan, South Korea, and the United States, and that's going to put more pressure on China and push China to develop a trilateral agreement between Russia, China, and North Korea, and then war. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's, so in addition to the, like, so we kind of have, like, three defensive arguments against this. Like, one, they kind of, like, already get along, already Western powers. Two, how much is this really going to spur, right, um, the trilateral defense cooperation? Three... Right, we have those arguments I made earlier, just like those other reasons they don't want to cooperate, given like their historical animosities. And then four, like yes, there are turns to these arguments. There are even cards that explicitly say that if we formed a trilateral security alliance, then yes, this would push Russia, okay, and China closer together, and maybe even make it more likely that they'll kind of defend North Korea. Like, and there's there's cards in the sanctions debate that say that even since China's like increased its sanctions on North Korea, that Russia's just like filling in the gap by like increasing trade with North Korea, right? So it kind of it kind of goes with that argument. So I think that you know, I think it's an argument you can make. I do think those are good answers to it. I think like strategically, just kind of like for the debate sense, like you you could make kind of an independent impact about like deterring like Chinese aggression. Um, now, of course, there's the, you know there's a debate like okay, well they'll offset by like having a bigger alliance, they'll offset by developing more missiles, but you could say, well, even if that's true, it would still deter their aggression in the South China Sea, right? And we have an impact to, like, what's going on in the South China Sea. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good debate. I, I think those are the core arguments um, in the debate. Um, I think, you know, the other thing, I mean, that's good discussion. So, like, oh, you're saying, so I'm on the pro, you're just arguing for indigenous Korean systems? Oh, okay. But that's part of your argument? Yeah, that's, yeah. 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 So you're using that to say they should just develop more missile defense to defend themselves in those other ways and create like a layered defense system. Um, I don't know how deep I get into like the layered defense yeah. system because Kimmy does a really good job of doing that. Yeah. But I have the same question as just basically like no one can tell a country that they can't defend their borders. So right. So they're going to just develop an indigenous system. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of, that's what the, kind of weird about the topic and I kind of like mentioned this at the end, but it's like worth discussing now. It's like, if you're con, right, you're obviously going to want to make a bunch of arguments as to why that's bad, because it's kind of hard to argue Aegis is bad, Patriots are bad, right? Like, okay, that other elements of the KMDS are bad. But it's like, you still have to kind of say, no, it's not in their best interest to have missile defense systems. Like, it seems to me that, like, I mean, the con has really good arguments against that. Like, it's a pretty good debate that might, may even balance a little bit to the con. But I think on the pro, you want to come back and say, yeah, but look, like, on the whole, like, even though that may be risky and, like, create some problems, like, and, you know, it's kind of like a framework, like, tea debate. Like, on the pro, I'd be like, look, you have to win that South Korea should not develop missile defense systems. It's plural, right? So you should, South Korea should not develop them at all. Like, good luck, right? Like, it's supposed to be, like, defenseless. I mean, there is a good debate about, like, which ones they should develop and, like, 
you know, especially there's a debate about like indigenous systems versus like bad. And there's debates about like sharing data. There's like a little bit of a defense spending debate, but even people are like, oh, we got to watch defense spending in South Korea. Aren't like, oh, we shouldn't have any missile defense. Um, and, you know, South and North Korea is just like really developing like its missile base. Right. So I think that's one thing I'd kind of like really kind of go for. Um, I think with that, you can argue it promotes like U.S. South Korean relations, which can read impacts too. And do you understand this argument about, about like protecting U.S. troops in the South? Okay, like how this, where we would redeploy from Japan. Um, now, I do think if the pro says, like, indigenous only, I try to argue that's not topical. I think there's two approaches. If the pro's like, we're only going to defend indigenous systems. Like, Brian, my friend Brian's like, well, my teams, when we're pro, we're just going to, like, defend indigenous only. We're not going to defend that. I'd kind of make an argument that it's not topical because it says systems, which means you have to defend them all. And I'd also kind of make a framework argument of just, like, well... It kind of renders the debate meaningless. Like the debates about that, like they're just really isn't like negative, other than like Korean spend defense spending bad, right? Against like these other missile defense systems. But even if then, if you wanted to, like, you just argue like, I mean, you could still make a Thad good DA out of that. You could say, look, you only support indigenous systems. Our argument is indigenous system, voting exclusively on indigenous system trades off at that, right? There are good cards on that argument. It trades off financially. It trades off politically. Trades off like in terms of focus and like that good, like kind of turning back their arguments. But I think that's that's something you need to like think about. Um, but I do so. But I also think on the neg, like you kind of need to generate your offense from like that bad. I don't I don't really think there is a lot of offense to these other systems. Like unless somebody wants to really develop like Korean defense spending argument, that's kind of like that's OK. Um, the other thing I talked about. So on these other slides, like slide 10, you can kind of see how these different like missile systems work. Right, so North Korea launches South Korea target. Like, so where does Pac-3 intercept it, right? It, it intercepts at a lower altitude, right? That intercepts it at a higher altitude, all right? And then like SM-3, which is still kind of being considered, right? We talked about that, okay? Is that, that can intercept at like much higher altitudes. But if you had all of these, you would have different layers of missile defense. Now these different layers, Right, kind of depend on like the where the missile like there's two things where the missiles headed. You have different you have different types of missile defense systems that intercept at different geographic ranges, right? So you have some that intercept at you know to protect Seoul, like the Pac twos, okay, assuming they launch far enough away. Others designed to like protect the south of like Korea. Um, then you have others that are kind of like they may they may kind of provide the same protection but in different ways, right? So you know, if it misses at the high at the high altitude, one misses, you like to have another shot at the lower altitude. And then there's some called like it didn't show any on here. There's some that are designed for boost phase intercept. Boost phase is when the missile first takes off. Okay, and if you can get it at the boost phase, the missile falls down. So that like kind of provides another layer um, protection. But look, you got to you got to realize too, like these just the defense capabilities themselves, right? Like Pac-2 has like a 40% success rate. Pac-3 has like a 70% success rate. Like that, like they say it's higher, but I mean, those have, those have been kind of been limited testing on that, right? So even, but I'm saying, even if that's like 80 or 85%, if North Korea lobs 10 missiles, one or two are going to get in, right? I mean, this is not like a foolproof like system, right? And then, you know, I mean, now you're, and then think about like, they're not going to lob one or two, they're going to lob like 100. So that's like 10 hitting. At a minimum, right? And a lot of 200. Like, that's like, you know, they have a lot of missiles. They have a lot of weapons. Their weapons aren't that high tech necessarily, um, but they have a lot of them. And I think, yeah. I think, I think someone had a card saying that North Korea won't just def like send all of them at once. Yeah, they won't send all of them at once. Yeah. Well, yeah, they want to retain some ability, but I'm saying they have like hundreds or maybe right. that, right? There was a car, there's a thing in here somewhere. I was a card I cut. I'll try to find, said like how many they have of each. I just cut it like yesterday or today, so I'll try to find it for you. Um, I think they have, like, a few hundred of the, like, 300-kilometer ones, and then, like, 20 to 40 of the, like, 500-to-700-kilometer um, like, yeah. ones. So, I mean, that's, like, you know, so if they have 300, that's, like, a lot, right? Plus, they're attacking in other ways with rockets, artillery. Um, you know, they're going to be infiltrating through the tunnels, right? right? So, um that's why it's kind of hard to, like, have a Korean war, like. 
yeah, kind of a mess, right? So, and then this next slide, it just kind of shows you like, like what hits what, right? So like a short range ballistic missiles, okay, which is, you know, this is slide 11, with 300 to 1,000 kilometers, pack three can intercept, right? But that means, look, in order for that to, in order for that to work, the defensive soul, they have to shoot that from like 300 kilometers back, right? Like, and then medium range ballistic missile, that's what that defends against, okay? Intermediate range ballistic missiles, then you have this other system, and then you have the ICBMs, which is more just kind of dependent on a global missile defense interceptors. But they can get that data from different places. And then this next slide, I think kind of shows like a good like map of the region, right? So it's like, look, you're China, like on the east coast, like look at the east coast of China, right? This makes it clear. So if you kind of have a missile and then, you know, Russia is kind of like part of it bleeds down there, right? So... You have Japan, North Korea, see how it kind of like if they're kind of, or South Korea, see how they're kind of really like, if they're tied together, like through a trilateral like security. And then you have like, look where the U.S. destroyers are, <laughs> right? You have two like destroyers just kind of floating there. And I think, you know, this slide's a little older. Don't we have like two aircraft carriers there now, right? Kind of floating in the, uh, in the East China Sea, right? In these other areas. So, I mean, it's pretty packed in. Imagine you have two uh aircraft carriers floating off the US coast with like two other countries right one Japan there's 50,000 US troops in Japan right there's 30,000 US troops in South Korea right so you can see how you kind of get this like encirclement like mentality but and you can also see though too where the um so south right south of South Korea that's like we're down there. We're going to deploy the THAAD. I think it's like S-E-O-J-U, and you have like Busan down there. So that's where, like, so the troops, the the 30,000 troops that are basically stationed in the north of South Korea. So along the demilitarized zone in Seoul, um, you know, pretty much in a war, all those troops would just die. All right? They, they just would. Okay? So, but they're a tripwire designed to draw the U.S. into the war. If 30,000 U.S. troops get killed, then the U.S. will definitely enter the war. So they're there to just kind of slow down the North Korean advance, not really to stop it, just slow it down. Well, then these other 50,000 troops, U.S. troops, have a chance to kind of make their way into the bottom of South Korea. And that way, but well, that's why we kind of arguably need missile defense down there to defend them, because if the North starts shooting Scud missiles down into those port areas, which they would, which they're obviously going to do, right? We, we kind of need to not have them all hit or like all our troops are going to get killed. Okay, so um, so that's kind of like part of their strategy. And then they just this last, you know, I put up this last slide because, you know, that, I mean, we're obviously talking about it. Um, you know, it has a 200 kilometer range, okay, reach an altitude of 150 kilometers. That's pretty high. But you see like that boost phase, that's what I was talking about earlier where the Missile that where the missile uh, can be intercepted like in the boost phase or mid course There are some things intercepted mid course or like the high altitude like the terminal phase when it's on the way down um, So those are kind of the but that's kind of starting to give you like a basics of it Like that's the one thing too. It helps to read like the better articles because when you read in the news media They're just like oh we need to deploy this thing to like defend like South Korea or some reporter will get it wrong Be like this thing has to defend Seoul well and then really defend solar and somebody will lie like, well, you just move it around to defend soul it's like well no because they're not going to shoot i mean yeah you can move it around so kind of defend soul but they're not the point is they're not going to shoot a missile they're not going to shoot one of these missiles into soul they don't need that they don't need inter they don't need like 300 kilometer missiles to destroy soul they can destroy soul with rocket fire and artillery fire they can destroy soul because they have a 1.2 million man army that can like run into north korea and Seoul's only 30 miles away. They Some people say that they have biological weapons already in Seoul that people will start releasing um, when a war starts, all right, that they can kind of go through the tunnels um, that they dug that, like, South Korea doesn't know where all of they are. So, um, you know, that that's kind of how they're going to destroy Seoul. They're not going to destroy Seoul with missiles. I mean, right? They may shoot a few from the north that, you know, maybe, like... Uh, a that interceptor properly deployed could like stop sure but that's not 
that's not like what they're after, right? That's that's not how that's not how they're trying to destroy soul. All right, but that kind of covers, you know, so, but the other thing to mention kind of just to kind of also just a kind of few notes about these other systems. So the Aegea system is important because one of the things that's bad and these other systems have encouraged, right, uh, North Korea to do is to develop more submarine launch ballistic missiles because those fly at low altitudes, right, like right off the coast. These missile systems are like completely ineffective, all right, the ones we kind of talked about it, it, it defeating submarine launch ballistic missiles. So that's why they need things like the Aegeus. But South Korea, I mean, North Korea is really trying to advance like those submarine launch like ballistic missiles, right, in order to defeat, um, in order to defeat the, in order to defeat the North Koreans. Um, so, I mean, in order to defeat the South Koreans. So, you know, that's like some of those cards, like even in your solvency content, like answers kind of say that. Um, but I think it's useful, even though it, I think it's hard, like on the pro to win, that like adding fat is probably really going to make that much of a difference. Like, unless you're really good at the argument that you need to protect U.S. troop redeployments for deterrence purposes. Um, I think it's kind of a little hard to win, but I would like definitely make the argument because I think the cons are going to like focus like a lot of their arguments on just like why the missile, you know, well, it won't really protect Seoul. They'll like wobble the missiles. They're like, create more arms to like overwhelm the system, right? Like there are kind of a lot of good like solvency arguments against like kind of missile defense, like adding more to it or whatever. But look, you can fence some of those off with like multi-layer defense. They serve different purposes, all that. But most importantly, I think they're going to get so obsessed with like debating that advantage that they can drop like U.S. like South Korean relations, which I think is a pretty good advantage. Like right now, Moon is kind of hesitating. Like, if you read the recent stuff, it's kind of like both ways. It's kind of like he's just slowing it down. Oh, we have to do an environmental impact statement, right? We have to kind of, like, talk about, like, how it's going to, like, maybe hurt people's health or something like that. He's kind of slowing it down, but he's not really, like, caving on it. You can say, like, look, if he really supports it, you know, like, Trump really supports it. The U.S. really wants it to be there. So, hey, this would really strengthen U.S.-South Korean relations, and U.S.-South Korean relations are important for the economy, which you can also use to answer that China turn. Right, there's a card like I cut that's like in the file that says like, well, U.S. South Korean trade is like way more important to South Korea than like Chinese tourism, right? So you can use it to like turn their economy argument. You can use it to you can say, hey, like this strengthens deters like another reason we deter. Um, I'm gonna just say it kind of strengthens U.S. capabilities in the region. You can just kind of read like random impacts to U.S. South Korean relations that are independent of that. Maybe you want to like try like the trilateral thing um so i think it's kind of in a way like it's like okay well you you know maybe you won this argument that it's not perfect all right but it's going to help but you've kind of not really answered or like u.s south korean relations of contention um but yeah i mean it's kind of you can see it it's not like uh um i wanted to show you on that slide 12 <coughs> Okay, on slide 12, there's a, where it says the Kaesiong Industrial Complex. This is kind of important because there was a, uh, kind of before, like, I don't know, maybe like a year, year and a half ago, the U.S., and this is kind of a big economic area, and South Korea and North Korea had, like, joint economic activity there. But then when all that happened, like, all the missile tests happens, and under this, the conservative South Korean government, okay, that, that, that economic cooperation was shut down. The new president, new South Korean president, Moon, it kind of like, uh, he wants to kind of go back to the sunshine policy, um, which kind of went to engage like Korea. One of the things he wants to do is open that complex. You can see how far it is on the border, close it is on the border. So I think one negative argument, another negative argument is to say, and this is kind of like gets at a lot of the pros like offense. Say, look, Moon is moving towards a sunshine policy is moving more towards engagement. And people say, well, what is engagement? Well, one example is it like wants to reopen this industrial complex. This is going to reduce the threat from the north, right? So you can use that to say, oh, it solves like any of these like pro-offensive arguments. Because I think one thing the pro is really going to want to say is, oh, oh, well, you know, it's inevitable. Like we're just, war's inevitable. Missile buildup's inevitable. Chinese aggression's inevitable. Like all your impacts are inevitable. We need the missile defenses to like try to deter as much as deter this inevitable weapons development to try to, you know, protect ourselves if it happens, to support our efforts to win the war, right? Like all these things are kind of like, you know, what the pro is going to say. So on the con, 
you know, you want to have something you can say nuclear deterrent solves or whatever, but you can also say, look, it's a better approach to go through this opening, this engagement approach, um, than to try an approach. If he really supports that and really deploys that, it's going to be really, it's really going to undermine the sunshine policy. And tomorrow I'm going to talk a little bit more about like the sunshine policy, like in a little more detail. So I don't want to go into it too much, but I just kind of wanted to like emphasize on the map, um, like kind of because it's on the map, like where it is. And you also can kind of see where that nuclear facility is, right? And you can see Pyongyang, the, the capital, like, you know, it's kind of like really far, like back there. Um, so, you know, they, their capital is much farther from the border than, right, Seoul is. And you can see, too, like, if you look at the interceptor ring, I mean, one thing you can obviously say, too, like, when you're pro is, like, hey, there's already a lot of, like, fat in the area, right? Like, Japan's deploying fat. Like, we already have a lot of these capabilities against China. Like, a lot of your arguments are non-unique. But you can see what we're trying to do there to, like, construct, a, like, a complete ring, right, to defend that. And part of it is because, too, like, in Guam, like, their missiles, those kind of medium-range missiles, like, have the ability to hit Guam, right? The nav We have a naval base in Guam. We have an we have a... Uh, a Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. So it also kind of threatens like a lot of our military and like our extended military. You know, those those like Guam would also have to, and it's in a war on the Korean Peninsula, would also kind of have to support that. Um, you know, and if you think about it, it, you know, there's still not a lot of soldiers there, though. There's only like 3,000, 2,982, according to the slide. Okay. So, um, Okinawa, oh, you can see kind of where Okinawa is, right? We have a lot of soldiers there, um, 35,598. Those are the ones that would kind of have to go up into, like, the bottom of, like, South Korea. Now, the ones from Japan, we have other ones there. We have a lot of air bases, but not as many troops. I think the total troops deployed in Japan is around 50,000, so it's only another 15,000. So the one thing is to think about is we don't really have, like, I mean, it's a lot of troops numerically, but, all right, so that's 35. We'll say 50 from Japan, a few thousand from Guam, so like 53. We only have another 30 in North in South Korea now. We only have like 80,000 troops. That sounds like a lot, but you have to realize that most of the 30,000 we have would already yeah. would just die, right? So that kind of only leaves us with 50,000 that have to be redeployed. And the buildup to the Gulf War, okay, against the FAR, right? And the Gulf War, I mean like when we attacked Iraq, and the buildup to the Gulf War, deployed like I think it was like 150,000 troops right into the region to, to fight a, a far inferior army right so that's why it's like I don't really think like I don't really think like you know we're about to have a war like in Korea unless the north like freaks out and thinks we're going to attack them so they like attack now because now they have a huge advantage um, actually this map shows our total count in South Korea right now is just 25,374 right you can see where kind of most of them are stationed up there okay so um, you know, we probably don't really have enough troops to like right in the region to like. There'd have to be a very, very significant build, military buildup before we could we before we could start like any kind of a war, um, because like you know we'd be like in a world of hurt like pretty fast. Um, also, there's just like tons of like tons of ten, like ten thousand Americans or more like living in school, right? So you kind of have to realize like you know there'd probably be like some it's kind of weird because like if the u.s starts to evacuate its citizens from like south korea like north korea knows what's up they have a huge incentive to strike first right um i mean south korea has an army too but i mean it's just like you know i mean they don't they don't have like all the weapons so anyhow that's kind of like the that kind of map gives you like kind of a good like you know having the total number of troops listed kind of gives you a good idea of kind of like what's there um, but it's like the topic, I mean, there are kind of like, the one thing I like about this topic is, well, at least in terms of the THAAD debate, there are like pretty good arguments on like both sides of the debate. Just like whether or not they should develop indigenous missile defense is like pretty, pretty one-sided, right? Like, and then if you look at in their best interest, well, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, the Khan's obviously going to say, well, cause a big war that's not in their best interest. Yes, obviously. But it's like, is it in their best interest to like try to defend themselves like yeah. in some way, have some missile defense systems? Of course, right? So... Um, that's that but like how, how have like some arguments played out in your debates 